This work by Marla Hladi and Eric Cheneau performs an unstable contact. It records on swinging, turning microphones, fleeting moments of sound and music to propel them forward, not into a solid stereophonic image, but as flying snippets and movements of sound that have the force to hit our ears, but are not stable enough to demand their own space and solid name. Their contact is passing, uncontrolled, playful, purposeless, but not frivolous. Instead, through the certainty of technological devices, mounted microphones, mixing desks and the know-how of Max MSP, it plays the insecurity of sound and its recording as a track on a record grasped by a needle that is in a most precarious and hovering relationship with what is played. This is a conceptual work rather than a composition. A sculptural intervention into sound, not as a physical build that spatializes its presentation, but as a mechanism, physical and mental, that enables its production. But ultimately, it remains invisible. A thought and its possibility rather than its object. And as product for our perception, the sculptural device, the work's dispositif, is not the mic stand, wooden plates and turning mechanism that facilitate this production, and neither is it the record player that continues it by propelling the sounds that touched its microphones in their passing in a centrifugal motion to pass your ears with the same speed into our perception. Instead, it is the flesh of sound and the flesh of our ears, our sensible in-between, that does not designate us as this or that, but makes of us contingent bodies of perception. This flesh of contingent perception is Maurice Merleau-Ponty's sensible sentient, that does not see and hear a positive, transcendental object separate from itself, but perceives things through its simultaneity with them in the negative space of their meeting. The invisible, the gap, the nothing of their vis-a-vis, -vis, where both are through touching and being touched. Contingent, the possibility of their meeting and passing shapes, rather, rather than according to a prior name and description. The fleshly body sees things through being seen and touches itself touching others and other things. Its perception is the intertwining of the self with the world. The self is not a transparent identity, but a contingent subjectivity, constituted in this entangled practice of perception. The flesh is the body as sensible sentient, as bodily indice in the world where we do not perceive exteriority, but respond to the world through the position of our body within it and form our reality from in between, not between things, but between ourselves and things. Things are encrusted into its flesh. They are part of its full definition. The world is made of the same stuff as the body. That's a quote by Maurice Merleau-Ponty. And to add and to take it away from the body at the same time, I would like to say the body is made of the same stuff as the world. This practice is thus not anthropocentric. This fleshly perception does not have to control the thing, the non-human through the privilege of the human touch as a grasping motion, but produces perception as flesh on flesh not knowing either before but getting to know through the unstable contact of touching and being touched invisibly. I'd like you to do the score with me. And we're not so many, so we have to move a bit together. But given it's quite chilly in here, that's probably quite nice. You do not have to take part, of course, but it'd be nice if we could. So if you'd like to join me here, and then if you find a partner, if the numbers are odd, you can also go together in three. So we stand back to back.
however close, however near you feel comfortable to it. And we listen to each other for about two minutes. And then we try to make the sounds of the other for two minutes. You are allowed to make sounds. Thank you very much. If I can't make this feeling right now for you more personal, the general consensus is going to fucking kill me. Recall manual figurations. Recall metaphors of hands. Recall your hands. My total impotence as an individual. My failure at freedom of speech. I'm already forgetting your face, so maybe I was playing myself more than I thought about having more feelings than most assholes. Liberty. I don't have to pay attention to all the things that are destroying my existence. The ultimate is gradually accomplished whether I watch or not. From Ariane Ren, Gare de Lyon. Toshio Tsunoda's track, Unstable Contact, on the album Senior of Decoclamania from 2004, is a sonic thought that makes us think what a contact is. 
its experience and consequence, and what it is connecting, what is touching and what is being touched. Sound is always an unstable contact. It is an insecure and unsecured connection that generates the world from the in-between or the negative space where things are not, but where their sound meets that of other things and generates their in-between, their being together and with each other. Listening to this unsecured connection, hearing the in-between, we can reassess the reality of a positive space, where things appear to be in their separate actuality, certain and stable, and query its truth and reality from the possibility of an unreli unreliable sound. This sonic contact is entirely ephemeral and yet very physical. It is the place from which we experience the world and ourselves in that world and we can contemplate and enact our connections, misses and happenstance. Here we are in the encounter, performing collectively and contingently the negative form of our in-between. This non-form does not limit what each of us and what each of them is, but is the possibility of their being beyond their name description as a being with each other, creating reality together on a wavering thread of sound. This core constituted reality is invisible, experienced in the ephemeral volume of shared sounds. Listening and sound making brings our bodies into these volumes and makes them be with it, add to it. To also not be this or that, me or you, but what we are together in the indivisible expanse of a sonic in between with everything else that sounds. As soon as I make a sound, I'm not just my certain form, but I enter into this volume where it's not about the floor and the walls and the ceiling, but this ephemeral space here that we can do together. So I'd like us all to make some sounds, any sounds, just to make this volume graspable that we have here and not just these black walls. Could you all make a sound, any sound? There was a volume, a volume of sound. Making sounds together, we generate and cohabit the in-between and gain access to the invisible and indivisible sphere of a connected world. This invisible touching of our sound makes our interbeing thinkable without denying what we are individually, by revealing instead how this individual identity is created in the in-between, the non-form that defines how things are formed. In this sense, our sounding together makes us think what the contact is, its experience and consequence, and what it is connecting, what is touching, and what is being touched. It makes us rethink the stability of contact, their purpose and direction, and allows us to contemplate also where the misses and happenstance might provide a useful way to think of how things are and how else they might be. The volume we create through the unstable contact of our voices is not the measure of decibels, but the expanse of sound, the invisible and indivisible spread of its vibration and density that has honey's liquid form and its reciprocal grasp. To again quote Maurice Merleau-Ponty, it, that is honey, comes apart as soon as it has been given a particular shape, and what is more, it reverses the roles by grasping the hands of whoever would take hold of it. And so, I think, does sound. 
as such a honeyed space, the voluminous time of sound cannot be known from a distance, but needs to be inhabited. It is a viscous space whose boundaries are fluid rather than fixed, ephemeral rather than solid. But nevertheless, it is a real and inhabitable sphere. Thus it is a sonic cosmos without walls, windows, floors and ceilings, formlessly formed from our being with every other thing. As such, it promotes the reading and experiencing of place, not as a planned and built architectural site, but an indivisible sphere. And it does not understand disciplines as framed fields of single-voiced experience. It also does not provide a bordered and solid political imaginary. Instead, the terms of its political governance, understood as the organization of how we live together, is agitational, interventionist, multisensory, and capacious, potentially inexhaustible and infinite, created from unstable contacts between things without a positive space and shape. Such a capacious sonic cosmos can be most vividly experienced and conceptualized when listening to a public swimming pool on a busy afternoon, sitting in a bathing suit with the waves in a place of uncertain lines. Full of splashing, shrieks and laughter, the sound of flesh and water buoyantly stretched in the reverberant echo of an aquatic world. Here the sonic space heard does not coincide with the architectural outline, but performs its own sphere, whose boundaries are not defined against walls, but through their invisible dimensionality, and whose objects do not exist next to each other, but through each other, with each other, indivisibly grasped in the density of humid air that includes me as a listening bather with others and other things in its voluminous spatiality. Beating eggs sends the motion of hitting a liquid into a firm shape. It sounds not the beating nor the egg, but the chiming of metal hitting metal through nothingness until the nothingness offers some resistance. The sonic resistance of viscous foam cushioning itself, rigorously sounding what it beats, it slowly changes sound, producing a sonic tautology the materiality of ephemeral fluff. The materiality of the egg's ephemeral fluff is sound's sonority. And it is this sonority that gives access to the visit connection between things that might touch briefly form unstable and unsecure connections, or miss entirely, but always produce an indivisible volume that sounds what they are contingently and with each other, rather than as separate things and signs, identified through the organization of the lexicon and the grammar of language. Thus in sound, space, social and political, intimate, private or public, emerges not as an institution, but as a contingent happening, producing a time-space place of interbeing and interacting things. Its authority cannot be assumed from its build and status, but has to be performed and re-performed contingently, admitting also the less heard and the incidental in its song. My cough, the screeching floor, the cleaner's hoover, brooms and shovels, a security guard's walkie-talkie, the wind and the rain.
I experienced this shared space in Ain O'Dwyer's Music for Church Cleaners, an album that was recorded in St. Mark's Church in Islington in London in 2011 and released in 2015. Her volume of unstable contacts cannot be known from a distance but needs to be inhabited as it finds its contingent reality in, in the interactions and encounters that realize its fear. It is a sonic cosmos formlessly formed from our being as interbeing with other things. The sonic cosmos is the sphere of Audre Lorde's interdependence of mutual non-dominant difference, to quote Lord within which, and I quote her again, lies that security which enables us to descend into the chaos of knowledge and return with true visions of our future, along with the concomitant power to affect those changes which can bring that future into being." End of quote. Lord identifies mutual difference without dominance as the true force for the emancipation of other voices that sound and I quote again, within that interdependency of different strength, the hope and preparedness for a community of difference from which the dominant, the positive and presumed sta stable can be unstaged. And so in O'Dwyer's work, we hear the organ as well as the church cleaners and the repair people at work at the same time. This other voice is that of transformation, of the invisible self formed in between and with others without becoming the same, aware of difference in an interdependent world as volume of coexistent things. This voluminous sphere of the world's sonorous expanse is then not a homogeneous mass, but is a viscosity created in internal friction. It is the formlessness of difference before it finds organization and the lexical referent that places it at the margins and in terms of what it is not. <laughs> it is difference in the encounter, not suppressed or ignored, but practiced. Thus it is, to quote Lord one more time, difference between the passive be and the active being, end of quote. And this active being is an interbeing that forms in interactions at the in-between through contingent encounters that take on honey's liquid form and demand the responsibility of participation, to be heard in formlessness, creating the chaos of new knowledge and preparing the vista for an unknown future without feeling threatened by its unfamiliarity. So I'd like to, us to do one more text score together. So instead of back to back, please go face to face. So you can sit down or stand up, whichever you like. Look at the face of the person next to you now in front of you. Start to imagine the inaudible sounds between you. Whenever you hear it, or them, make that sound. The face, entreating yet ultimately indifferent, stares back from the pages of magazines, from the billboards, flyers and screens. Within these faces, it is the eyes that have it, the eyes that judge, the eyes that implore, the eyes that constitute irrespective of their place within the pictorial border, the gravitational nexus of the image into which attention is initially drawn. It is interesting to consider that in the pseudo-public media spaces, it is the same eyes which frequently hear the, bear the brunt of the delinquent viewer's intervention, 
providing a target for chewed gum, scrawled biro, and smearing or tearing fingers. From the Reluctant Sitter by Angus Caroline. However, this invisible, fragile, and imaginary meeting in sound, which we tried to, in effect, practice this morning, the instability and formlessness of the sonic sphere, which can allow us to perceive a sensible sentience, a contingent self, an interdependent difference that turns us into active, capacious, and entangled beings that defies walls and differentiation and has the potential for a different reality, open at the negative, the invisible, the formless, spaces and possibilities, can also be abused. Its mobility arrested, its formlessness deformed, its instability defamed, its passing nature ignored, its transformativity mythologized, its audibility overheard, its openness defaced. Because sound, just like Elencidus Feminine, does not chase its own revenue. She does not recover her expenses. Sound is not the being of the end, but how far being goes. Thank you.